Okay, build distributed object system. Oft questioned, never really fully understood. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess most of us have used some of those parts of it. Some of us are pretty more experienced than others. Um, and uh, probably other people can give this lecture even better than me. Um, but here I am. Distributed objects, we'll talk about it. Uh, we'll start with the fundamental concept. Can somebody hand me a marker over there? Uh, the idea of a distributed object is uh, fundamentally an object that has properties that is visible on multiple different uh, uh, environments, multiple different machines, particularly multiple different clients, and also the server. Um, so you can think of an object that has some lifetime, it, it exists, or it, first it doesn't exist, and then suddenly it exists. Uh, it has certain properties, it does things, there are events that happen on the object, and also there are state that changes on the object. And you want to uh, uh, update the, that copy of the object on all the uh, clients that know about the object every time some in interesting part of it changes. And then at some point uh, in the timeline, the object ceases to exist, and you need to tell everybody that that, that happens. Um, so that's the fundamental problems we're trying to solve with distributed objects. Um, and that means we need to have um, we need to have a generate message that gets sent to all the clients in the world when an object comes into existence. We need to have uh, event messages that happen when something interesting uh, happens to the object, and we need to have update messages when something changes on the object. And finally, we need a delete message when the object goes away. Um, and um, let's see, all of this in our framework happens to a central server, uh, of course the OTP server, we all know about the good old OTP server, which actually internally has several parts to it, which we don't normally know about. In particular, there's a message director, there is a state server, and there's a database. Uh, I think there's one more part, oh, the event server, we don't care about that so much. Um, Fine agent. Fine agent, oh yeah, 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 thank you. Uh, a few other parts. Um, Mostly, uh, when we're talking to the, um, the OTP server, we're either talking to the message director as an AI, or we're talking to a client agent as one of the clients. Uh, the other parts are uh, just deal with themselves, but they're uh, crucial to the, uh, the fundamental things that uh, the that whole server suite does. Um, uh, when this runs on the actual server, each of these uh, pieces might be running on a different box completely, or they might be running on uh, different processes within bo one box. When we run it in our de develop development environment with the OTP server.exe, they're all bundled down in into the same executable, which is kind of handy. Um, these all listen on different ports, and you can open up a, a web server and talk to uh, your local host at, I think, 7272, or is that old? Does anybody know? 7801. 7801. Uh, there's a front, front door to uh, all these boxes. They all have, each of these has their own little web page. And you can go to them and query their various states on the web page, which is a useful thing to know. But I, I, the port number I keep forgetting with that is. Um, 7781. 7781? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> that sounds right. Um, anyway, the, uh, the main thing that deals with the distributed objects, as we're going to talk about today, is the state server. Uh, this is the guy that is responsible for knowing about where all the distributed objects are and what their state is, a persistent state that we care about distributing. Um, there's also the database, which is responsible for keeping the long-term uh, state of these objects. Uh, some of the things that we set on a distributed object, we only care about during the session, such as, for instance, an avatar's position, uh, what uh, uh, direction he's looking, and things like that. These are session variables that we don't care about preserving for the long-term. Other things we do care about preserving, such as the amount of gold he's won, uh, his experience points, and things like that. Uh, those things get written to the database, um, things that are only persistent to the session stay in the state server, things that aren't persistent at all, for instance, a chat message. I say that once, and if you happen to hear it, great. If you weren't there, you don't hear it. Um, that doesn't get saved in the state server, but it gets propagated to everybody via the message director. Um, but uh, from our point of view, as Python programmers, we don't normally need to think too much about what's going on in here. Uh, the first thing we do as Python programmers when we're starting with a, a distributed object is create a, a schema for it in the DC file. The DC file is a, 
a list of schemas for the various kinds of objects that we might be creating and the messages that they have and the kinds of state that they, they store. Uh, it is um, written to sort of simulate or resemble a C++ format for no good reason, uh, other than that uh, when we first designed the DC file, we, we weren't using Python at that time. Uh, C++ was the only language that we had consistently to everything else we've done so far. So we use C++ as a, uh, as a template for the language for DC. Um, and uh, there is a, a file that uh, everybody ought to look at if you're going to be looking at DC files, which is in direct, and it is direct source doc, and it is sample.dc. And this file has lots of interesting things, uh, sample syntax for things that you can put in a DC file is pretty useful. Um, but I'll go over some of the, uh, the highlights. I mean, most of it you can get just by looking at one of our existing DC files. Um, but the fundamental things that we have, the, the most important thing we have in a DC file is a D class, which is a distributed class, and you'll see lots of these. Um, and every D class has some name, uh, which uh, typically corresponds to the name of a Python class. It doesn't necessarily have to. Uh, let's imagine we're creating an avatar. And then within the DC class, we have lots of uh, interesting fields, like uh, uh, suppose we have int 16, oh, I don't know, uh, his weight. He might be 65,000, or actually, let's make him uint so he can be 65,000 pounds. Uh, if we had only an int 16, it would be minus 32 to 32,000, of course, typical range of events. We also have int 32, uint 32, and uint 32a, and we have 64-bit integers as well, although we hardly have used them. Uh, if you wanted to use a floating point numbers, we got those, um, although we only have float 64. Uh, we felt that uh, there's no particular reason to have float 32. If you really want a, a single precision floating point number, you can encode it with an int, uh, because we have a, a single precision energy support, which would be something like int uh, 16 weight divided by 100. This syntax means I'm going to take an int 16, and then I'm going to uh, implicitly divide by 100 whatever value I store in here. So this means the actual range of weight for my Python programmer is going to be in the range of minus 32, well, minus 3.27 to 3.27, uh, because uh, uh, I just had a two decimal point. So this gives me a fixed point representation. I can store 16 bo uh, bits of, uh, of, of numbers, but I have two decimal places. And if I want a bigger number, then I can in 32. If I want more precision, I add on these numbers here. Um, we hardly ever use float 64, uh, but it's there if you really want it. That's basically a double. Um, we designed originally the whole uh, distributed uh, system for minimizing the bandwidth of our communications, which is why we have the emphasis on these small uh, integer values and we, we make it really easy to compare int dates and int 16s and kind of awkward to use floating point numbers which are kind of big. But we do have the string object, which people maybe use more than they should. Um, and you can pour any old arbitrary string in this and it is basically a, uh, a uh, length terminated string. Uh, so we'll store a 16-bit uh, length and then the string itself as a sequence of characters. Uh, which means you can store a string of up to 65 or 64k uh, characters in length. Uh, and if you put it in there and send it, it'll go out in the wire. Um, that's which is fine if it's an occasional message. Chat messages, for a perfect example of wanting to send a string. Um, we had some problems in the early days when we were trying to optimize our bandwidth, and we were realizing that, uh, for instance, the, uh, the notorious butterflies in Toontown Central, um, which are constantly fluttering and changing state between flutter and land and uh, find a new place, and we wanted to make those distributed so that you could stand in one place and everybody could see the same butterflies. Um, and the first implementation had a FSM that was changing state, and we actually set the state on the wire as a, uh, as a string name. Uh, so that meant that uh, you got, you know, 20 butterflies zooming around, all changing state every three seconds. You're sending a lot of strings on the wire. Turns out our butterfly uh, telemetry data was dwarfing everything else in Toontown by a factor of about 100. <laughs> um, so you gotta be careful. Is that all client side now? Uh, it is not, it's still distributed, but we, uh, we're a little smarter about how we're sending it. Uh, I think we don't send the state changes every time it transitions. We uh, probably do what we did with some of the other things where we, we send a, uh, yeah, probably it's mostly a client side now. If we did it right, we would do a, uh, a random number 
up first as a seed and send that down. Then each butterfly would just follow a random path. Yeah. I'm not sure how we're doing it now, but it's better. Um, and we also have one more type, which is the char. Char is basically the same thing as an int 8, except that uh, when it's displayed semantically, it prints a, uh, a string character. Uh, and uh, Python easily accepts a string character as a uh, int 8, whereas uh, if you actually declare an int 8, you need to pass a, a numeric value, which is a little bit different. And we have one more, sorry, that's the blob. And a blob is exactly the same as a string, um, except that a blob is semantically means it could be any old byte sequence I, I, I'm giving you. I don't, I'm not going to tell you anything about it. In particular, it's probably something binary that you shouldn't try to print. Uh, this mainly means something useful to the ATP server. If you look at the database and you look at the data for your field, it'll print. If it sees a string, it'll print that value in, in quotes. If it sees a blob, it'll print it in hex. Um, other than that, it doesn't much interpret it. Um, sometimes we use blob uh, for data structures that are uh, packed and unpacked strictly on the client or within our own Python code um, that we don't want to try to encode in the DC system using numbers and things like that or too complicated to encode in the DC system. Um, but we can encode quite a bit of complexity in the DC system. Now, I've written all these types out uh, and in fact you can declare uh, elements like this data elements directly inside a class. Uh, normally we don't do that. Normally we declare them inside of a function type thing. So it looks something like this. Um, uh, now when we've done this, this is almost the same thing as declaring an int16w in the class body, except that uh, I can set it as a method. Um, and when I, I set up a whole bunch of pieces, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, ultimately this looks like a distributed method that we're calling on the class. And there's a lot of magic that happens under the, system, under the hood. And we've, we've all seen this, we understand that it works, but uh, it's good to know and understand exactly what's going on when we do this. Um, but for now, just understand that set weight like this means I'll be, when I, when I call the distributed set weight method, it's going to send a message on the wire that's going to include this n16. And if I had any other values in there, who knows what I've got. Um, sure. Whatever parameters I pass in here, they're all going to get packed into one long message and sent along the message. Uh, and by the way, uh, let me point out also you can do arrays like this. Um, C style arrays, you can specify a fixed length of the array or you can leave it empty um, and it will be a dynamic array. Whatever length array you provide will be filled in. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get more on that, uh, the methods in a minute. Um, there's a few other fancy things. Well, yeah, no, let, me, let me go ahead and talk about how the methods work. Um, actually, let me take a step back. Uh, let's go back to generate. Uh, the first thing we do when we create a distributed class, okay, we've got we've got a class specification. Now we've got enough to, in principle, create an instance of a class avatar. Uh, this means we have to go to the AI, and uh, on the AI we will uh, send a message to the uh, message record and say, create me an instance of this object called avatar, and here's the do ID for the object. So that means every distributed object has a unique do ID, which is just an integer. Uh, I think we're up to 32 bits, uh, and uh, we also specify a zone number at the time we created that, if I'm not mistaken, um, and that's also 32 bits, but we only use 16 bits of them at the client level. Um, the AI, I just mentioned him in passing, he is a Python client. He works actually in principle very much like any other game client, except that he's got special privileges. In particular, he's got privileges to create objects. Uh, whereas a client typically doesn't. Um, but for other purposes, as far as we're concerned from the Python side, the AI is pretty much the same thing as any other client. He sends distributed messages just like the other clients do. He gets messages just like the other clients do. With a few special messages he's allowed to send that other clients call. 
Um, we call it AI because, in principle, the AI process is running everything that's AI-like in the game. But it does more than just AI, of course. It's handling all the little fiddly bits of you know, opening doors and responding to the customer anytime he does something interesting. Uh, UberDog's the same situation, uh, as far as the uh, Python code is concerned. He's an AI-type uh, process. Um, he's privileged enough to uh, send special messages, but other than that, he's basically the same thing as any other client. Um, OK. So the AI wants to create an avatar. He sends a special message to the OTP server that says, I've got an avatar. I want to create it. And I'm going to create it in this zone. And here's this do ID number. So it's up to the AI, the AI to make up a unique do ID number that nobody else has. Um, all of the, uh, uh, well, once, once that has, has happened, the OTP server, specifically the state server, uh, records the fact that there is now an avatar with this do ID uh, in a particular zone that's indicated and any initial state that might be on the avatar. And now the initial state uh, comes from the required fields. So this is an example of a field. Uh, we should have been called a method, but they're called fields. Um, here's another method. Now, there is a room for keywords on the end here. And we've all seen these keywords and wondered about them. One of them in particular is. Uh, required. The required uh, keyword is a particularly special one, which means when I call generate, uh, that means that this field has to have a definition. If it doesn't have the keyword required on the end, it doesn't necessarily have to have a definition. This field may not have any value at all at the time I call generate. Um, so typically, we would do things like um, uh, position, if we were if we were doing it this way, often requ uh, position would not be required because at the time we generate, it doesn't have a position. We add the position later, um, but we could actually make it required, and that means we'd have to know where he is at the time we generate him. Uh, in my example here, the name is something that we uh, we need to know right off right off the bat. Now, what actually happens when we uh, we have a required field at generate. Especially, uh, by convention, any required field should be called set something or other. And that's because uh, when, as soon as we generate it, we pass the uh, uh, Python object that corresponds to our avatar to the generate call. It's going to take any required fields and take the name set off the front of it and replace it with get, and then call that method. So that means we, when we define our Python class that corresponds to this avatar, We better define a method called get name. So. so this is the only name mangling we do. Uh, by convention, any required field should be called set body blah. And then as soon as we generate a field, on the AI, we're going to call it get body blah. And that get body blah should return whatever set should pass. If set only has one parameter, then the get corresponding get function will only return one object, one item. If set has multiple parameters, then the corresponding get should return a tuple or a list, and it should contain the same number of parameters. Um, now, this get method is confusing for a lot of people because what ends up happening is we have a a, a shadow class over here. going to have a get name and a set name method. And it sure does look like uh, any time we call, uh, we change a name, uh, all the clients are going to call get name and figure out what the name of the object is. This is part of the magic of DC. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work that way. It's not quite that magical. The only time get name is ever called is at the time we call generate. Uh, so if then we change the, the name later, uh, and uh, we still got the same avatar in existence on the server, it's never going to call get name again. It's then up to us to actually call the distributed version of set name and tell the server that we just changed its name. Uh, so the only reason we have the get name is just as a convenient way to tell the server all the required fields. We could do this differently. We could have said, at the time you generate, you must pass a list of all the required values, um, and then that would be part of the message. 
But instead of doing that, we, we figured it's easier to have the uh, server pull out the Python object since it's already there anyway. Uh, but it does lead to confusion about the magic get name function. Does that make sense to everybody? That's one of the biggest confusions that I see with learning the distributed object system. Um, okay. I did skip over a, mi uh, a minor detail in the first place. Um, the fact that we've got this uh, distributed schema here in DC uh, doesn't necessarily mean anything by itself until we create a Python class that's almost got the same structure. Um, and in order to match them up at the top of the DC file, we have to import the uh, Python file that defines the corresponding Python class. So there's, uh, the DC file understands the import statements. And uh, it, when you see the import statement, it reads that file and looks for a Python class uh, inside that file with the corresponding name as your distributed class. And any methods that you define here, it looks for corresponding methods on the Python class. Um, and then whenever you call the distributed version of set name, it's going to, on each of the clients, look for the particular instance of the Python class that corresponds to that distributed object and call the Python set name function directly, passing in whatever values you pass in here. So this magic happens, and this magic is one-to-one is -one bound. Any method you have here is actually bound to the corresponding method, method in Python in, this, in the sense that whenever you make a distributed method, it directly calls uh, the corresponding Python call. But there's not a one-to-one -one binding on the getName function. That only happens once at the time of create. Now, so uh, let's take a Another step back to the big picture. I'm here on the AI. I create an avatar. This means what I actually do is create an instance of the avatar class, my avatar Python class. And then I call on the uh, repository, create this object, and I pass it my avatar class. And then the repository will take the uh, avatar class, query all the distributed, or all the um, get functions for the required fields, and build a big message which says, here's the avatar class, here's all the required fields, send this out. And that means that any clients who then happen to be listening to the same zone that I said I put, wanted to put my avatar on will get a message that says, here's a new generated object. And this is a generated object, a generate message. <coughs> and then the clients, therefore, uh, in response to that message, will create their own in instance of an avatar, a Python avatar class. Um, <coughs> and then they call each of the required uh, fields, that which, which came in that one big message, set name, set name, whatever, uh, set x, y, z, anything required gets called immediately. Uh, which then we'll call the corresponding Python function, presumably uh, assign the appropriate value on the Python, uh, this client copy of the object. So now after this has happened, we have still the original object of the avatar that we created on the AI, plus a copy of the AI, of the avatar object on each client that is listening to that zone. If a client, a particular client comes into that zone thereafter and uh, sees that the avatar is there, he gets a new generate message. Uh, as long as the avatar con continues to be in that same zone, when the client enters that zone, he gets a new generate message. If the client leaves that zone, he gets a disable or delete message for that object. Um, so that means the, the, client, the uh, client is responsible for adding and removing the instances of the objects as they come in. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, now, the one other thing I've been glossing over is the way that you send a distributed update. Um, I've been saying the distributed version of this method. Um, so let's look at our Python class again. We have a, our set name method. Um, This Python method is automatically called whenever a set name message comes in on the wire. Um, we also have, by convention, a uh, D set name method. Now, we're not universal in this convention, but this is one of the early conventions that we established, and um, we've followed it to lesser or greater de uh, degrees as we uh, develop code, a little bit lesser nowadays. But the general idea is the D underscore means this is the distributed flavor. And all this does is going to call self.cr.send update. Actually, just send update. Is it just send update now? C uh, yeah, the self of the distributed object has a built in. 
It might be. It would probably make more sense. It used to be self.cr. Um, and set name. Fundamentally, we're just calling this special method, which ultimately funnels down into the client repository, uh, the name of the method that we're calling and the list of arguments that we're passing to that method. And this gets matched up into the DC file. Uh, it looks up this name in the DC file, and this gets matched into the uh, argument list for that particular method on the name. And this will generate a message uh, which gets sent to all the other clients, presumably their uh, broadcast. I'll get to that in a minute. Basically, anybody that wants to listen to this object will get a set name. He'll get a set name message coming in on the wire, and any other clients will then get set name called on their object, and they'll, they'll be able to sign their name. The catch is, a uh, distributed set name by convention doesn't call it on myself. Just because I've made a distributed call, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to change my own. So we have another convention, which is the both set name. And all this does is turn around and call D set name and set name. Uh, so anytime I want to set my name and set it to everybody in the world, I call the B underscore set name version, which is going to set my own copy and also everybody else's. If for some reason I only want to send a message to everybody else, I call the distributed copy. And if I only want to change my own copy, I'll just call my local copy. Um, that's the ideal. Of course, in reality, you have all sorts of crazy things and do all sorts of crazy uh, uh, different, uh, different functions. And this uh, schema doesn't really fit that tightly in the, the real world. But whenever it's possible, we try to, we try to do it this way. Not ever particularly old occurred as that worked in. Um, when you call this set name, doesn't it automatically return to you as well? It does not. The original design was that it should not as a minor optimization on uh, communication bandwidth. There's no reason for me to send a message on the wire to myself. I know what my name is. Okay, let's go back uh, to the DC file. Um, is everybody good with that? So in the DC file, I mentioned the uh, keyword required up here. There are other interesting keywords. Um, RAM is often used. RAM means this will be persistent in state, uh, so that anytime I set it, it will be uh, uh, rebroadcast re re to anybody else who comes across me later. If I didn't set RAM, then the method message will only be sent to those people who happen to be in the same zone at the time I sent it, who happen to be listening to that zone at the time I sent it. If I add RAM, then that means if anybody comes into the zone later and sees me, they'll get set name at that time. Um, this is particularly important for things like name, which I expect to be persistent, but a chat message probably is not going to have set RAM on it. So one way I could do a set chat message is something like this. And this is the sort of thing where if you happen to be there to hear it, you want to hear it. If you're not there, you come across it 10 minutes later, it's too late. You, you missed it. So this is not a RAM field. Um, that's maybe not the best example, but uh, it's a fine example for now. Um, something stronger than RAM is DB, which means not only is it persistent in memory, but it wants to be persistent long term on the database. Uh, use caution when adding a DB field because it really gets permanently written to the database. If we ever publish, uh, your change with a new field with a DB on it, uh, then it, immediately all the games, uh, all the clients out there start getting this new field added to their database record. If it's just a work in progress and you then want to add new parameters, uh, we might have to do a database patch because um, uh, it's difficult to modify the uh, uh, schema for existing database records. Uh, if it's just RAM persistent or not even that, it doesn't matter, you can modify this to your heart's content because you've got to restart the whole process, the whole server and all the clients to get everybody back in with a new change. 
But if you have it a DB field and you make any changes after you've already been pub published a change, it means all the existing database records have been just become invalid because they're no longer matching a new schema. Um, let's see. What else we got in there? Broadcast. Uh, broadcast, yes. Um, broadcast is one of the most common things. Probably both of these, well, certainly the name is probably something that really ought to be broadcast because everybody who sees me is going to want to know what my name is. Um, if I don't do broadcast, it means only the owner of the object uh, gets that message when I send it by default. Uh, and the owner is typically um, the creator of the object. In the case of the avatar, which is a special case, uh, the, avatar, the owner of the av avatar is the client who's playing the game. Um, but most of the objects are created by the AI. That means if I don't have broadcasts, only the AI will get that object, that message. Um, so typically a broadcast, you would leave off broadcast if you want to send the message to that object. So the way we typically do chat, for instance, uh, is chat is I, I get the object I want to say something, or whisper, I'm sorry. If I wanted to whisper something to somebody, I'd get a handle to his corresponding avatar and call set whisper on him, and that means he is receiving a whisper message from me. That would not be broadcast. That's just a message to that particular player. Um, but if I have a set chat, that is broadcast because that's something I'm saying on me. That's something that goes over my head and suddenly is everybody in the world can see that. Um, anybody who sees me gets to see the broadcast field. Okay. Uh, and we've also got, let's see, CL send and own send. These are just security permissions. Um, if a field doesn't have seal send on it, it means uh, no client is allowed to set that field. And if a client s tries to set that field, uh, the server will shut up, uh, hang up on them. Uh, this is just to prevent people from setting something they shouldn't be able to send. Uh, so, for instance, um, name. Yeah, name. I can't set my own name. That would be bad because our name has to be filtered by the uh, uh, whole name process, name approval process. So, uh, if and I can't set anybody else's name either. Um, so if I, tr if I get a handle to anybody else's avatar in the world and try to call set name on it, the server will balk on me because we don't have CL send on this field. Own send is, um, is a little bit uh, uh, stronger than CL send. It means only the owner, which in the case of the avatar is the uh, client. Only the owner can set this particular field. Other avatars can't set it. So for instance, um, uh, if, if we had a more per permissive environment and I, had, I was allowed to set my name, then my name might be own send. Certainly chat is own send. I can set my own chat string, own send. Nobody else can set my chat for me. Um, and in fact, our own set name is neither seal send nor own send because we're not allowed to set our own names. Uh, and finally, we have AI receive. Uh, typically, the AI is going to receive any messages anyway um, because the AI owns most of the objects. But the, in particular, the avatar, as I said, is not owned by the AI. Uh, avatar is owned by the client. So if we want the client, is, if we want the AI to receive a message on the avatar, which is not a broadcast message, we need to put AI receive, and that just means a special message goes to the AI. Um, in the modern day of pirates, where we have multiple AIs, it's not quite clear what AI receive really means. Um, but the original idea was the AI, and that's the way we implement it in Toon Town. I don't even know what it means nowadays. I think you still need it if you want cross communication between two like an Uber dog and an AI, I think you need to use that too. Sounds plausible. There's some weird <laughs> cases for that. It'll be that one. Okay. okay. It's for if you want to let a client send an update on AI on the object. I don't think the AI receives them by default. Yes, you do. You have specified CL send AI receive. That might be a change. Uh, it, originally, it was true that the AI would receive any update on its own object. I don't um, know that that's still the case. That may have been true. Yeah, yeah that's plausible. Uh, I think this is all the list of keywords we got right now. Is anybody? Um, there's a few weird ones. Seal, receive, ignore completely. Don't ever use it. It's not actually one that that Roger will look at it and be like, okay, that's great, and not use it for anything. You might so. see. There's another one, P2P, which has been retired. Yeah. No longer. P2P. Yeah. Uh, I think P2P was P2P was actually replaced with seal, seal, yeah, receive, seal, send, or own send, and stuff like that. Yeah. Replace that. So. Um. Yeah. Uh, furthermore, this list of uh, keywords is actually vestigial. These are the ones that are hard coded into the DC parser, but actually the DC parser is more general than that now. You can find any keyword you like. At the top of the uh, DC parser, you just put keyword whatever you like. 
Um, and that means you can tack a new keyword called Fubi on the end of any methods. Now, nobody's going to listen to that. Um, it's not going to mean anything. Uh, but in principle, we could do this, and then we could have uh, Roger's uh, new server could listen for this new keyword and do something special with it. Or we could have our own code. The AI code could do something special with any keyword you'd like to define. Um, so there's room for defining your own keywords, and then you just write custom code that does whatever you want it to do. Do we do that at all? But I want to point it out because every once in a while somebody asks for, hey, what if we had a new keyword that does this? And you don't actually have to go back into the DC parse and change any code. You just, you got it. There's lots of ways to get around required. Um, the send generate with required. There's some stuff in distributed objects, the code for there, for basically saying, I want to generate the object and I want to send these extra eight fields that should be updated too with it. <coughs> Oh uh, yeah, that's a good point. So right, there's a special way uh, if you want to generate an uh, avatar or an object of some kind and send all the required fields as well as additional fields that you want to send at the same time that you need to have sent before the object is generated. There's a special message for that. And just treat them like required for the generate purpose on the AI. Yeah, that's yeah. We, there's all sorts of race conditions that we found as we started maturing the system. Uh, so sometimes it's very important to have fields uh, present on the uh, from from day one that uh, aren't necessarily uh, marked required for some reason. Uh, OK. Let me talk a little bit more about some of the funny things you can do in the DC file. Um, you might see this. That's a percent sign, if that's not here. Uh, the idea here is um, when we're setting a uh, heading value, uh, we can set, um, we don't really care about setting the entire range of, uh, of heading values that might be. In fact, on your node, you might have a uh, heading value that goes up to 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. It's, it's all the same between 0 and 360. Um, Rather than have the whole thing error out if you happen to wrap about around the uh, limits of N16, we just do a modular arithmetic here, uh, which means um, whatever value you ran out of the Python structure, go ahead and take that modular 360, and then divide it by 100 to give us that fixed point. Um, or actually, it multiplies by 100 before it stops it. Um, so this is just a way to uh, um, store a, uh, any kind of circular number without having to worry about the balance of your uh, integer being exceeded. Um, doesn't get used often, but it particularly gets used in this particular case. There's a few other cases where you might see that. Um, we have, let's see, it's also possible to have range limits on your other values. For instance, suppose you had a number that could only be 1 through 1,000. You can do it like this. And this means the uh, DC system will just yell at you if you try to pass any value that ever goes outside that range. Um, and normally it will yell at you if you exceed the uh, uh, storage limits of your specified type, uh, but this can constrain it even further. Uh, and this is just a useful thing for self-checking. You can do crazier things too. For instance. Uh, you can have comma-separated lists of ranges. Um, you can also have um, dimensioned arrays. You can have a fixed-length array like this. And this means you're going to resend 100 bytes every time. Uh, or you could have a variable-length array, which you, you could just leave out. Or you could say maybe 5-20, which means the array must have at least 5 bytes, uh, won't have more than 20. Uh, and it'll send a dynamic array of the appropriate length. Um, and there's, let's see, we can also do structs. So, suppose you wanted to have, uh, let's see, So 
So I declared the struct called nums, which has uh, three XYZ integers. Now I can just pass that as a parameter, and it really is passing XYZ. If I, when I call this in Python, I can, uh, if I happen to have a Python class called, called nums, it's going to query nums.x.y and .z whenever I pass an object in. Or I can just pass a tuple or a list, and it'll pull off the first, second, and third elements and call that uh, x, y, and z. And furthermore, just to be crazy, you can pass in a whole array of these things, for instance. And if I pass this in Python, I might pass an array of structs or an array of tuples. And it'll pull these whole things out and pack them into this uh, variable length array, which each, each element of which has three integers. So in fact, you can build quite a lot of complexity here as long as your uh, uh, very, uh, various combinations of integers and characters and strings um, in structures of various forms. Molecular? Sorry? Um, molecular fields? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. We have molecular fields for only one purpose, and that's to save a tiny bit of bandwidth, particularly on the, the messages that get sent all the time, especially telemetry. Um, the way this works, if you see in distributed object, or distributed node, we have, uh, we have three fields, set x, um, set y, and set z. Now, we could just call, anytime we wanted to uh, update the position, we could set x, set y, and set z independently. But we also have a special method called a molecular field because it's built up of these atoms. Set x, y, z, I think, or maybe it's called set pause. And it is defined colon set x, set y, set z. Now this is only a network savings. But what this means is, I, if I call the distributed update for set x, y, z, uh, it's actually going to send one message, which is going to have the fields uh, x, y, z packed together into one message. On the receiving end, it's going to receive it as a set x, set x, set y, and set z, separate calls. It won't actually do that. It will receive set x, y, z, and then you have to process that out to store the values. Ah, but really? That's a gotcha that you have to be very careful of. So yeah, I, I didn't even know that. Okay, so it'll call set x, y, so we still have to have that method. You have to make that method, and then you have to process things based on that. Okay, so we'll define a set x, y, z that we'll call the individual components. Um, that's interesting. Well, that's probably better. Gives there's us more there's power. a to-do sitting inside of our code. Too. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> we'll get to that one day. Um, but the whole point of this is that um, it saves the bandwidth of having to set these messages, send three different messages for updating one element. Um, we uh, end up setting the same thing. Oh, oh, you know what's different though is uh, if we call this right, we we call this set XYZ distributed, and anybody who's listening to us right then is going to get the distributed uh, set XYZ method. But anybody who comes into the zone later yeah. is going to get the individual components. Um, and the reason we have this is because ultimately we might want to just do sometimes set x, y if maybe only x and y have changed, z hasn't changed. <coughs> well, we can save one tiny little byte and not have to send the z. So we have all these variants on combinations of set x, y, z, and h, p, and r. Um, but in the state server, it has to store them just component-wise because, come on, you can't set x, y, z, and then set x, y, and then set z, and then what the heck is that going to be? So it's going to have to remember your individual components, x, y, and z. And then when you come into that zone later and see the object, it's going to get the individual component calls on it. So yeah, this is a pretty confusing system. Uh, so yeah, I don't recommend using this for anything other than this real tight, uh, high bandwidth issue. Swell. So far so good? Pretty basic stuff so far. Um, there's another thing that comes up from time to time, which is confusing. Uh, when um, when we get the delete message uh, before an, an avatar that goes away or some object that goes away on the client, uh, it can be inconvenient for the other clients that might have been doing something with that object. Um, for instance, maybe somebody built up a, uh, an integral that has an avatar walking around or turning or swinging a sword or, or battling a cog, throwing a pie, doing something. And suddenly, in the middle of that interval, the avatar goes away, boom. Uh, and we had this problem for a while, and uh, that would mean that the client would crash because he's trying to play a, uh, an interval and the node path he's trying to play is gone. Um, 
So I work, work, worked around this problem by introducing a concept of delay delete, uh, which means uh, we, as soon as we uh, do something with an avatar that we want to keep a hold of that avatar, even if he actually is going to be deleted, uh, we set the delay delete function on the ob object. And then if a delete message comes in, it gets postponed until such time as we clear the delete, delay delete flag. And then it gets deleted on that, uh, that, that point. Uh, and the easiest way this uh, is implemented is just to create an instance of the delay delete object. The delay delete object uh, simply is a, a very simple Python class whose constructor uh, sets a delay delete flag and whose destructor clears it. Um, so this just makes sure that we have everything bounded, we don't leave a flag hanging. It's, it's kind of like a reference count. Um, so you see this used uh, in, in places, but this doesn't actually delay the delete message itself. All that it does is prevent the object from being removed after it's been deleted. Uh, so the Python instance of the object still persists, even though it's not going to be receiving any more messages. Um, it's been deleted, uh, and we know that it's been deleted, but we can still lurk it around with notepads and things like that. We can still apply animations to it. And the only reason we have this is just so we don't crash while we're doing some stupid little animation. Uh, great. Inheritance. Uh, inheritance. That's a good point. Um, uh, class hierarchy exists in the DC file, um, and we can inherit a, any class from anything else that works the way you expect it. Uh, you inherit all the methods that you get in the normal way. We also support multiple inheritance, um, and it pretty much just works the same way that it works in the Python class. Um, with a few gotchas. Um, when you overload a function in the distributed class by name, it doesn't properly overload the way that you normally think it would. Um, it usually works, but what, what's actually happening is you're just shadowing it. So if I were to over, uh, if I were to inherit from avatar and define a new instance of set hipper, what it really has done is define a new field called set hipper on my new class, which is going to shadow the original set hipper. Um, and mostly it's going to do the right thing. Uh, but there are times when um, this causes problems. Uh, Molecular is a big one. Yeah, that's the yeah, that's overload the problem. Those. Yeah, if I were to overload avatar and define set x, uh, hoping to uh, change the behavior of set x or the parameters of set x, it's not going to change my molecular field set x, y, z. Um, that is a problem. Um, yeah, oh well, another reason not to do the molecular stuff. Uh, multiple inheritance mostly works. Um, Again, the normal issues with uh, Python inheritance and multiple inheritance in general. Um, what happens with diamond inheritance? Oh, bad things. It does. <laughs> it's not. Yes. Yeah. The order of shadowing stuff. Uh, <laughs> yeah, with diamond inheritance, you end up with two copies of your base class in your uh, in your root class. Uh, I think it'll mostly do the right thing, except for cases like required fields. You might get the required field in there twice. Um, yeah, it's probably not bad, but we avoid it. Um, well, the other thing to be aware of is these classes are not, you don't need to have the exact same hierarchies as you do in code, and you wouldn't want to necessarily. Right. So, like, these are just interfaces. So don't, you know, don't go crazy trying to add mix-in interface things all the time. Just curious. put the yeah. fields in and let them go. Yeah, in general, we... It, 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 we loosely follow the same class hierarchy between the DC file and the Python file, but there's no strict reason that it has to be faulted at all, uh, other than the uh, sanity of the programmer. Uh, and uh, of course, if the Python class starts to have all sorts of crazy uh, classes that it's inheriting from and uh, mixing in and things that don't necessarily even have a DC interface, uh, there's not necessarily a reason to have that same structure here. Um, if, as far as that goes, we could just uh, we could avoid inheritance altogether and just duplicate all the interface specifications for every class that we use. Uh, that'd be fine. Uh, it's, it's just a management issue. It's a question of uh, do you want to duplicate code or do you want to uh, do you want to copy code, inherit code? Sometimes, sometimes the right answer is to duplicate, depending on complexity. Okay. Um, one more thing I think is worth talking about, that's the network time, uh, which we uh, 
we send via the uh, distributed system frequently, and it gets used in a lot of places, but it's frequently misunderstood. So it's worth, uh, worth talking about. Um, fundamental problem with network time, with any kind of uh, game-based system where we have things that happen in real time on different clients, and hopefully should happen at the same time on different clients, uh, is synchronizing clocks. Right? Every, every CPU, every computer has a different clock. Um, so you can't really just go based on time of day although it'd be swell. Getting closer with NTP these days, you might actually have a fair chance to, that, that might work, um, but still not reliable. In fact, we've, we've come across with clients who have you know, time of day clocks that you know, years in the past, years in the future. Who knows what these clients are running? Um, uh, fu fundamentally, we don't even care about time of day. What we really care about is events happening on our game that are happening in sync on all the machines. So anytime we have a time-based event, uh, that is to say, we want to send a message that says event X happened, you know, three seconds in the past, or event X happened will happen in 20 seconds, or you know, event X uh, happened at time time Y. Anytime we send that kind of message, we need to have some lingua franca of time to talk about, and that's the idea of network time. Um, in fact, we do this with a um, telemetry. Every time we send a position, we send the time at which that position was uh, seen so that we can uh, uh, properly smooth the position over time. Um, uh, so this is, this is uh, what the tele telemetry timestamp looks like. It's just one call, and we have an N16 timestamp. Uh, but in general, anytime we have some kind of event that happens, like, you know, set, uh, um, I don't know. Say it again. Suppose we wanted to say that some event happened at this particular time. We just pass uh, a timestamp either as an N32 or as an N16. Um, and we, whenever we pass time on the wire, we pass it in, in network time. Now, there is a global clock delta, which you can inherit. I think it's probably even a global object. Uh, and global clock delta has two methods in particular. It has network time to local time. I'm not going to write all that. It has local time to network time. And the idea here is um, you take your uh, panda time, which is um, Going a blank. How do you get panda time? Get real time? Sorry? Clock get frame time. Yeah, global clock get frame time, right. So if you, in, in your panda client, you can call global clock to get frame time, and this returns the time in uh, panda units of the current frame, uh, which is a time elapsing seconds. Uh, you're not supposed to care about what the time zero is. Uh, in practice, time zero is almost always the time that the application started, uh, but it doesn't really matter that much. Um, anyway, you pass get frame time to your global clock delta uh, local to network time, and it's going to give you back an integer. And that integer is something appropriate to pass in as a timestamp. When you receive that timestamp method, you take that integer timestamp and pass it to global clock delta network time to local time, and it will give you a floating point number, which will correspond to your uh, get frame time. Now, the way this works is pretty, uh, well, it's pretty confusing. Um, first, it's important to know that we do have two different kinds of timestamps. There's a 16-bit and a 32-bit timestamp. And they are both integers. Um, and they are precise to within one hundredth of one second, uh, which means that for the 16-bit timestamp, we have about a plus or minus five-minute window. And then the timestamp rolls over. Um, because that's minus 32, 32.7 to plus 32.7, right? 7 .00, 0 .00. This is the number of seconds we have in our 16-bit integer. Um, so that's plus or minus five minutes, roughly. <coughs> what that means is, if we if we send a message that says this event happened at this 16-bit timestamp, everybody who receives that event within five minutes is going to know exactly what time that happened. But once more than five minutes has elapsed anybody who receives that very same message is going to be confused. 
um, they might think it, they might receive it and understand this to be a time in the future, even though it's actually a time in the past, or vice versa. So we have two choices. We we can either uh, repeatedly send this set event message and uh, update this uh, timestamp from time to time. Uh, we can just uh, refresh the timestamp, or uh, basically we, we can we're limited to reporting any times within plus or minus five minutes to the present time. Or we can just upgrade to a 32-bit timestamp, which gives us about plus or minus a year. So as long as the AI stays running for less than a year, we're good. I think that might happen. Yeah. <laughs> and you can change the accuracies on those to make them like incredibly accurate to a second. You can, um, but then you're you're a little. Um, I, I don't think you can do that easily without little plot delta because well maybe I'm well, not sure. part of the. Oh, I could be wrong. I, well maybe you can. It, there might be a parameter. Um, but the one thing that you do change often is this, is a bit count. And when you when you call network to local time, you pass in the number of bits you want, 16 to 32. Um, now the way this all this works is when the uh, when the AI starts up, he's got his own get frame time counter, which is incrementing the normal way. And uh, when the client comes in, uh, the client communicates to the first thing he says to the uh, to the AI is uh, he uses, takes advantage of a method on the time manager, which says uh, request server time, and that just basically asks what time is it right now for you. Um, so he, the client's going to send a round trip method. The client notes his own time, sends a round trip method to the AI. The AI reports his time. When the uh, client gets back that result, he's got the time at which he, he asked, which is time x. Then he's got the AI time, which is time a. That's the answer. The, the time at which the answer came back, which is y. So someplace between the bracket of x and y, between the time he asked the message and the time he got the response. The time on the AI was time A. Well, okay. That means we know that the time on the avatar, uh, on the, the delta between our time and the time on the AI is some number here. We take the, the median, I think, and a difference set between A. And then we know that the difference between the AI time and our time within whatever tolerance this window is. Say that window is, you know, one second. That means we know within one second what the AI time is. Hopefully we get a fast response in that. I think it tries a couple of times to try to get something within uh, a uh, 200 milliseconds or something like that. Um, and from time to time, because blocks drift, some blocks run faster than others, uh, we have to requery that. I think we're set to requery it every 30 minutes, or if we happen to hear any telemetry from the na neighboring avatar that seems to be in the future, we requery at that point. Um, so basically we're from time to time asking the AI, what time do you think it is? And we store the delta between the AI's time and our time. And we use that, uh, sort that within globe plot delta, hence its name. And we use that to compute the network to local time. Basically, when we go local to network time, we take our time, we add the delta, and then we modulate that within our uh, five minute window, or one year window. When we go local to uh, network time, uh, we take the uh, uh, closest time uh, within the window of that number to our current time, either plus or minus, and subtract the delta and uh, convert it back to a floating point number. Does that make sense? Okay. I think our timer is just about done anyway. So um, there's a little bit more I could say about the DC Packer. Uh, the DC Packer is the fundamental implementation to actually packing all this data for the messages. Um, and it's a pretty powerful thing. You normally don't have to deal with it directly because the DC system will do it for you. you just path you know, call this me uh, message and it automatically reads all the Python objects, extracts all the data, stores it in a bitstream and sends it on the wire. But if you ever need to, there is the low-level class that you have access to in Python that does all this work. And you can also use it to format out the data and print it in a pretty way. Uh, we use that, for instance, when we get an error message. If something is wrong when we're processing an event, um, or processing a distributed message, we use a DC packer to print the actual messages that we received in a nice, pretty formatted way. And the database, the OTP server actually uses this too. If you go to the database and look at any of the uh, data fields, it uses a DC packer to print the values of the data fields in a nice, pretty formatted way. Um, I won't go into how to use a DC packer. It's kind of obtuse. Uh, but there is a document in direct source doc again. Uh, I think it's dcpacker.txt. So anytime you want to learn about reading the DC packer and doing all this little stuff, you can go ahead and read that document. It explains all about it. It's great stuff. Uh, okay, it'll be on books on tape next week. Um, one, one other thing. So the remember that blob field that he was talking about as a data type? 
it might be really tempting when you're working on stuff, if, if you haven't already thought of this, to pickle Python data and send it and unpickle it to get a nice Python object. Don't ever do that. It's <laughs> really expensive. The uh, pickling is not efficient. Yeah. That's a good point. Pickle, pickle is, is not very efficient. It's, it's, it's very slow and it's big. And you can also pass any distributed class, D class, in as a struct. So if you want, you can pack a whole object into one field if you need to. Uh, it's crazy to do, but talk to Roger if you're ever interested in it. I hope, I hope you never have to. We do it for human <laughs> DNA now. It's, it's 